everyone. This is the uh, SAA Student Chapters April event. We're excited to have you here. Um, if this is your first time, welcome. We think you're going to enjoy it. If you're a returning uh, visitor, uh, we hope you're going to love this one as much as you have enjoyed our past events. We think um, we've done a great job of lining up some really interesting archives and speakers this semester. And tonight, is no exception. Um, just a few quick reminders. We are recording this meeting, um, so we'll have that event recording by the probably the end of the weekend. If you missed it or if you want to share it with someone, um, that'll be on both our website and our YouTube channel, and we'll send out a link via Canvas and, uh, and our social media channels. And um, just a reminder, please keep your microphones muted and your cameras turned off. Just it'll help us go uh, make things run a little smoother and feel free to um, post any questions you have during the event in the chat box. We're going to kind of hold all questions until the end, but definitely just post them as you think of them and we will get to as many as we can within the time limit. So with that, I'm going to hand it off. Oh, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Allison Carrion. I am your chair of SAASC and I'm going to hand it off to Samantha Hamilton, who's our vice chair who put this event together so she can introduce tonight's speaker. Take it away. Thank you, Allison. Uh, as Allison stated, my name is Samantha and um, we're really excited to have our special guest speaker, um, archivist Joanna Black with us tonight, um, who is from the Sierra Club's William E. Colby Memorial Library. Um, she's gonna help ring in uh, Earth Month with us today um, by explaining a bit about what she collects. So with that, I'm gonna pass the mic off to Joanna. Hello, everyone. I am going to share my screen now. Hang tight one moment. Okay, and let's get in the mode here. All right. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about William E. Colby Library at the Sierra Club where I work. Um, sort of a special collection, special library. My name is Joanna Black and I am the archivist at the Colby Library. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm located on the occupied land of the Ohlone in Oakland, California. I have my email here in case anyone ever wants to reach out, feel free. So today I'm gonna to talk about, uh, it's just a little overview of the Sierra Club and how it sort of started and the Colby Library's role in that. Um, I, and I'm gonna to end today by just telling you all a little bit about um, the equity journey of the Sierra Club and sort of the role of the library within that. So let's begin. Sierra Club of 2021 in a nutshell. I say in a nutshell because the Sierra Club is a very, uh, it's pretty old and a very complex organization with a lot of chapters and groups um, all over the country. So it's kind of impossible to tell you everything about the Sierra Club's history and what's going on now, but I'll do the best I can. <laughs> so the Sierra Club's mission is to explore, enjoy, and protect the wild places of Earth, to practice and promote the responsible use of the Earth's ecosystem and resources, to educate and enlist humanity to protect and restore the quality of natural and human environment, and to use all lawful means to carry out these objectives. The Sierra Club really focuses its efforts in sort of three main areas. Um, climate and justice, within that there are campaigns like Ready for 100, which aims to bring cities into 100% renewable energy. There's also Beyond Coal, which is working to uh, retire existing coal plants, as well as stop any new constructions from happening. Uh, there's Fighting Oil and Gas, the Sierra Student Coalition, and Clean Transportation are just some of the campaigns. Um, additionally, lands, air, water, and wildlife, this is sort of more of the conservation side of the Sierra Club, and within this sort of umbrella is land conservation, protecting wildlife, uh, protecting water resources, forests and the way that climate change is affecting it, uh, borderlands, 
things that have to do with sort of the, the environment uh, as we consider sort of natural environment. Um, but another big part of the Sierra Club works towards uh, people and justice. So this includes campaigns like the, the Green New Deal, um, working with folks to lessen toxic materials and increase health. Um, it also includes gender equity and environment, um, a big one being environmental justice and uh, finally labor and economic justice. Sierra Club also has a publishing arm. Uh, this is Sierra Magazine here. It's the national magazine of the Sierra Club. It was originally named the Sierra Club Bulletin when it was first published in January 1893. And it was this time that I was really focusing on firsthand accounts of visits to the Sierra Nevada. Um, people's reports about, you know, their mountaineering or a hike or exploring a certain kind of quote unquote unexplored area. Um, and this kind of continued up until right around the kind of Earth Day or first Earth Day. So you get a lot of change in the Sierra Club at that time. And by 1977, Sierra Club Bulletin has changed into just Sierra, what we know today. Um, and it's, like I said, a national print magazine. There's also a digital element to it. Um, and it publishes content that is dedicated to protecting the natural world but also um, highlighting issues that are near and dear to the Sierra Club membership. Now, I had two links that I was gonna add into the URL that I kind of forgot in the beginning. Um, there's the Sierra Club homepage, which is www.sierraclub.org. And that is sort of the main hub for the Sierra Club. And then the Colby Library webpage, which um, we'll be talking about just in a moment is sierraclub.org forward slash library. So the Sierra Club beginnings. You can't talk about the library without talking about the origins of the club. And I said, when the club was a club. So it was founded in 1892. Uh, John Muir was one of the co-founders out of 183 charter members. He's sort of thought of as the sort of figurehead creator of the organization. A lot of people falsely credit him as being the founder, um, but he actually was working with other folks to do this. Um, it began in San Francisco and it has pretty much remained in San Francisco, except now it's in Oakland because of rent hikes in San Francisco a few years ago, but um, basically in the Bay Area. So the early membership really reflected a lot of the Bay Area's sort of most prominent educators and business people. Um, it was always male and female from the get-go, which is very unique of the time. Um, but you do see a lot of overlap between the Sierra Club membership and a lot of California history. Um, John Muir being a great example, he's everywhere. So uh, by the time that the century changed, 1901, you start to see uh, the club focusing more on bringing their membership outdoors. So they were based in a, a conservation uh, movement at this point to protect uh, what we know as Yosemite, Sequoia National Park, um, really making sure that the national park system is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, but in 1901, we have this figure, William Colby, who is the namesake of the library, and he comes up with the idea of starting Sierra Club outings. Um, and so these outings would bring folks together uh, yearly in the summer to go into a specific location in the Sierra Nevada together and camp out for a couple of weeks. Um, very successful. And, and it was really to bring the membership out into the place that they were trying to protect. So you could get firsthand knowledge and experience with, you know, being in the Yosemite Valley. What does it feel like? What does it look like? And this was a tactic to um, bring in more membership, but also kind of get people's fire going. So these high trips were very successful. Um, it was so successful, in fact, that it kind of switched the club into more of a social and recreational society. So throughout the 19 teens, 20s, and 30s, um, you get a lot of folks going on trips together because they want to learn mountain climbing or they want to hike together or, or kind of practice these early outdoor uh, recreations. And it was 
incredibly um, forward thinking. A lot of them are very, a lot of the membership became very famous first time climbers of certain peaks. And this knowledge was kind of harnessed when a lot of the membership were drafted into World War II. So then you get um, experienced outdoors people who can pass this knowledge on to other uh, soldiers and that increased the membership quite rapidly. So by the time that the war was over, we see a huge bust in the membership, a lot of people wanting to join the Sierra Club. And that brings us to the early 50s, uh, what we call the David Brower years. Uh, so David Brower is an interesting figure. He is a very famous um, mountaineer. He edited and contributed to uh, the Manual of Ski Mountaineering, which at the time was a very uh, prominent mountaineering book. But he uh, actually influenced the Sierra Club enough that they decided to make him the first ever executive director. Now with a background in publishing, he was really able to kind of harness the book as a way to bring people who otherwise would not be in these wild places kind of to them. So he created this series called the Exhibit Format Series. And these were coffee table books essentially that had huge photographs of Grand Canyon or Mount Everest or these sort of different wild places that most folks had never seen and probably would never see, but in this way, we're able to kind of capture some of the beauty of, of those places. And it, it was a highly successful campaign really to um, get people to you know, start fighting some of the environmental problems that we we're seeing. Um, so David Brower really kind of activated club membership. It was sort of the early days of the club being more of an activist focused organization. Now, David Brower, one of his famous sort of uh, things that he did for the club was he would take out these ads in the New York Times or other major newspapers. And you can see in the top right corner, um, just a kind of top half of one of those ads. And this one is an example, I'll, I'll read it out loud. Should we also flood the Sistine Chapel so tourists can get nearer to the ceiling? And this was in response to a proposed dam in the Grand Canyon. And so what David Brower would do is he'd post these in the newspaper with all the sort of facts about what was going on. And then he'd include a little coupon that could be cut out and sent back to the Sierra Club for readers to kind of show their support of the movement or to join the club. Um, and it was a really successful campaign to pull different people into the club. But there was one problem. The Sierra Club is, was at this point a 501c3 nonprofit, meaning that um, lobbying is not allowed. Um, so the IRS jumped on these ads really quickly and told the Sierra Club, you can't do this. You're, you know, it's against the, the nonprofit code or, or what have you. And so that resulted in the Sierra Club forming the Sierra Club Foundation, which is still in existence today. So you have the Sierra Club Foundation and the Sierra Club organization. Um, the Sierra Club organization now is a 501c4, which means that they are allowed to lobby for issues, lobby in Washington, um, really kind of get more involved politically, which they were not able to do prior to David Brower. Um, so now his exhibit format series books, which I talked about, are very uh, successful. They're, they're selling a lot up until the late 60s, and folks aren't really buying them anymore. And this puts the Sierra Club in a really sort of bad financial place. Uh, and the board of directors at the time wanted to hold David Brower responsible. So he was essentially um, forced to resign in 1969. But in a lot of ways, him resigning didn't change a whole lot about the sort of activist energy that was emerging from the Sierra Club. So then you got 1970, which is when the first Earth Day is held. And the Sierra Club was among the organizations at that time who participated in this first Earth Day. Afterward, efforts by the Sierra Club and others led to the passage of really important legislation like the National Environmental Policy Act and the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and so throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you really see an increase in um, 
sort of activism and conservation, but also people starting to notice that the Sierra Club is protecting, you know, nature, but what about our communities? What about the toxins and pollution that we have to live with in our communities? Why isn't the Sierra Club talking about that? So in those three decades, um, in part because Earth Day helped kind of galvanize the environmental movement in the U.S., uh, you start to see a lot more push against some of the um, the uh, what am I going to say the the sort of pollution that's going into rivers. You see um, a lot more push to end pollution and to have standards in that area. Um, and you see the Sierra Club members going to Washington a lot and actually lobbying for a lot of the issues. Now, where does the library fit into this? That's the question. So the library maintains and provides access to historical and special collection materials in order to help promote and protect the Sierra Club brand, to provide research support to the board of directors and the executive staff, um, and volunteers, members, supporters, scholars, researchers, you know, we're here primarily for club use, but that does not stop um, the public from being able to access the collections as well. Then we have a lot of different things in the collections, um, ranging from Sierra Club publications like books and journals that the Sierra Club produced. We have photographs and slides given to us by membership that maybe they took on a club sponsored trip. We have tons of oral histories that have been being produced since the 1970s. And these uh, really reflect a lot of the sort of older uh, membership and what the experiences were like in those days versus what was going on now. We also have a really wonderful uh, art collection, fine art collection, as well as scrapbooks and photo albums, films and videos, textiles, all sorts of different things. Now, this is an example of uh, some of the objects in our collections. The trunk there is sort of branded with the address of the first Sierra Club headquarters in San Francisco. We also have a lot of 3D objects like this stuffed burrow, which is adorable. And it was used to help train children on the best way to pack their burrow. There was a, a period of time where the Sierra Club was sponsoring what they called burrow trips. And essentially you'd be going into the Sierra Nevada on a burrow, you know, camping in different places. And so this was a, a great tool for young folks to kind of learn the best ways to pack um, their animal. And then we also have things like this 52 base camp book. So the base camp was a Sierra Club outing that um, would, every summer bring a group of people for a couple of weeks into a particular location and that location would be the base camp and then every day uh, folks could do day trips you know either climbing a specific um, cliff or doing little day hikes or just hanging out around the camp and when you get like 100 people together to to camp you get a lot of interesting stories and um, things happening. So the base camp books were kind of these yearbooks for the trip. Um, they contain campfire stories and campfire songs. They have photographs of the area that they were um, camping in. They have scientific specimens, flora and fauna examples. Anything that a person wanted to submit from the trip, they could do that. Um, and these actually were digitized last year through the California Revealed uh, program. So if you are interested in viewing the base camp books, you can check them out. Um, the link will be in the chat. Uh, they're really amazing, full of really interesting little tidbits, uh, ranging from the, I think, 1940 to the early 50s. So the library has, or the Sierra Club has maintained a library actually since its beginnings in 1892. The first library was based on a small collection of mountaineering publications and actually was destroyed in the 1906 San Francisco fire following the earthquake. But the membership was energized and they soon established, reestablished the library through an outpouring of donations. This is a picture of our current space that um, I haven't been in in a year, but it's wonderful. Um, you can see the books in the back 
Um, and there's also an area where there's sort of more archival objects too. Oops. So the library over time, the use has shifted dramatically. In the early days, it was really a resource for membership to explore topics like skiing or mountaineering, hiking, things of that nature. And then later it became much more of a resource for the production of Sierra Magazine. Nowadays, the library has kind of shifted more towards preservation of its existing collections and providing reference services like back checking aspects of the Sierra Club's history. Wanted to shout out to William E. Colby, who I, I mentioned is the creator of the Sierra Club outings, which is still a program that goes today. Um, he was a monumental figure in the Sierra Club, uh, kind of almost like a mythical figure. He went on every outing um, up until he was too old to travel. And he really influenced a lot of people. Um, Ansel Adams, who is a world famous photographer, was also a very prominent Sierra Club member. And he said about William Colby, you knew who he was without inquiry. He comes with him a deep humanity and the mood of rivers and forests and clean white stone. Now the Colby Library is unlike any collecting institution that I've ever seen. That is because although the library has materials surrounding the Sierra Club's history, publications, photos, like I mentioned, the official Sierra Club papers are actually not held in Colby Library. So the Sierra Club's official archives are at UC Berkeley at the Bancroft Library. And this is a relationship that goes really far back. It started in 1958. And since then, um, any of the sort of uh, non-working papers, um, prominent leadership papers, things that are really traditionally archival and maybe are a little bit too big for us to store on site at the Colby Library, those have all moved to the Bancroft. And so those records include, like I said, the national headquarters papers, uh, the papers of more than 70 activists and staff members throughout the years, and also the records of the Sierra Club's DC office, the California legislative offices, the Legal Defense Fund, and of course the Sierra Club Foundation papers. Now I can't talk about the library without giving a shout out also to the Higmans. Um, Jim and Sue Higman were longtime members of the Sierra Club and big activists um, centered, uh, centered in the Los Padres chapter. So they were um, not centered in the Bay Area. They, when they passed away, left a very large endowment to the Sierra Club um, and actually directed it toward Colby Library operations exclusively. So it's because of the Higmans that we're able to exist and do the work that we do in Colby Library. Everything from sending materials out to be digitized, to hiring me, um, to having the space even, you know, paying the, the, the rent in our space. So if they were not who they were, the Colby Library would have shuttered, I imagine, quite a long time ago. So thank you, Hickmans. Colby Library in the digital age. So I kind of gave you an overview of the library and what it used to kind of collect and, and the role of it. Um, but today, we're much more professional than the library ever was, meaning um, in the past, the library was run by volunteers. There was at one point a library committee and a history committee who kind of would make large decisions, but most of the labor was always volunteer. Um, 2017, however, you get the retirement of Ellen Byrne, who was the last long-term librarian. And she worked there for a couple decades, um, but did, was not a trained librarian, came in through a different department and had so much work to do in the library that really, um, it, it was, I don't wanna say overwhelming to her, but there were a lot of areas that could not be addressed just because the resources and the people power weren't there. So in 2017, she retires and soon after, Therese Dunn, who is the current librarian, was hired. And Therese saw an opportunity here to really bring the library into the 21st century, to make it more relevant to the Sierra Club staff and members and the public at large, 
So she had the idea that digitizing would be a main focus of the club. Um, if we could digitize some of the important materials, folks could access them remotely. And a lot of the Sierra Club uh, staff and members are not local here, not in California. So it is important that we have remote resources that we can share. Um, so in 2018, I was hired as the first digital archivist. And um, this was to help facilitate these large scale digitization projects. But it became pretty clear early on that being a digital archivist was not going to be sufficient for these collections, that there were a lot of archival practices that needed to be implemented before things could actually be digitized. And so in 2019, my job title changed to archivist because this would allow me sort of a broader scope to oversee the non-bibliographic, non-published collections. All right, here's our here's our staff right here, uh, the complete staff. So Teresa's there on the top, and like I said, she oversees the entire Colby Library, um, from the budget to project plans. Um, she also runs most of the reference. She works almost exclusively with the bibliographic collection, um, along with the fine art collection, as well as documents and reports and other published CR Club materials. Now, I, on the other hand, sort of oversee the you know, more archival materials and so the unique materials, uh, the materials that we would consider non-bibliographic. And in order to kind of bring things up to a place where I could start doing some big digitizing, um, we needed to know what was in the collections. Nobody had ever surveyed what we had. Nobody had ever even done basic accessioning. No one had put donor records together. So I felt in a lot of ways like I was starting from scratch um, when I came in because there wasn't any of the sort of common documentation or workflows in place that exist in other archives that I've worked in. So um, one of the first things I did was I did a survey of the collections. We needed to know basically what we had. And then um, through that, I started accessioning collections sort of formally in archive space and creating um, donor records. I also uh, began an archive it project too to start archiving some of the Sierra Club's web content. And I also still do digital stuff as well. I manage the Sierra Club's uh, Colby Library portal in our digital asset management system. And I basically oversee um, any of the digitization projects that, that go on. Special collections. So I'm, I'm calling our collections special collections because they're not traditional archival collections. It's not a traditional library where it's just books. It's, it's a collection of many different things. So, I wanted to give you a little bit of an example here of the range of, of materials that I'm working with. Um, on the left side here, you see an open book called In the Canadian Rockies. This was actually a very, very rare publication by photographer Ansel Adams of prints that he photographed uh, in one, uh, during one of the Sierra Club outing trips that William Colby was leading. So he put this beautiful book together dedicated it to William Colby and presented it to him. And William Colby then gave it to the library to preserve. Now this book is, like I said, extremely rare. It's one of the most valuable things we have in our collection. Um, and it has been fully digitized. So if you're interested in seeing um, some really beautiful Adams photography, um, we have a link here that we'll put in the chat that will uh, take you directly to, to that digitization page. And it's unbelievable. It's, it, gorgeous, gorgeous photographs. Now we also have scrapbooks and this is an example in, in the top left, right corner here of what I'm working with. Sometimes it's just a page, but you could tell that it was in a scrapbook at one point. Um, other times they're in bound editions, but really all I have to work with as far as description is usually if it's labeled. Um, so you see that these are labeled on the bottom. Sometimes you can figure out based on the year what trip it was or what members were there, but there's not a lot of documentation about any of the collections that I work with. So unfortunately we can't say a lot about them, but as I work through the collections, 
I find little clues all over that sort of speak to a certain donation or a certain object. And I'm able to kind of build some provenance that way. But these are just like two examples of some sort of more photographic based materials that we have. I've also been doing a lot of digitizing um, since I've been there. And these four collections are, are just an example of some of the collections that have been digitized. We have three main large photograph collections, and one of them is the Edward T. Parsons photographs. These uh, contain about a thousand unique images. They were unfortunately in nitrate format negatives that uh, if you don't know about nitrate is a very flammable, dangerous material to have on site anywhere. Um, so that was one of the first things I had to do when I was hired was send these out to be digitized so we could then destroy the nitrates. Um, it's also the one of the first collections that I will be processing and I'm in the middle of processing right now. And I hope by the end of the year to have not just a finding aid up on OAC for the Parsons collection, but to also link the digital objects that we have in our digital asset management system into the finding aid so folks can really get a sense of the scope of this collection. They're very early photographs, 1900s to about 1915, um, so are a really interesting resource for early California history. We also have just kind of, well, they're smaller collections. <laughs> we have a lot of very small collections. And Christie's collection here of Sierra Club outing slides is an example of that. Um, all I could find were two slide boxes that had her name on them, had a year, and that's about it. So I wanted to digitize these uh, because one, there weren't a lot and there was a good sampling of uh, images that I could choose from but also because it contained these photos from the 59 and 60 um, outing trip that happened that year. So it's a great visual documentation of those outings, which we get um, questions about a lot. So there's no finding aid for this collection. There isn't a session record, but hopefully as time goes on, we will have that on OAC as well. Now the Colby Library Graphics Collection is an assembled collection that contains posters, placards, banners, things of that nature that were produced or were affiliated with the Sierra Club and its campaigns over the year. So we have chosen about 50 posters to be digitized, um, some of the older, more rare images, and actually just got those done about a month ago. So we're excited and I'm kind of right now putting them into our, our dams and hopefully those will be publicly available in the next year or so, along with all the other digitized collections that we've been working with. Now, finally, I wanted to talk about this Ansel Adams photographs of the Weyburn family. The Weyburns were uh, Ed and Peggy Weyburn. The Peggy is here, she's the mother. Um, two really, monumental figures in the conservation movement and in the Sierra Club itself. They were um, involved heavily in the Alaskan Wildlife Refuge and setting that up, as well as a number of other projects in the Bay Area. They, uh, like I said, were heavily involved in the Sierra Club during this time. Also, as I mentioned, Ansel Adams was involved. So obviously they were friends and this, collection actually shows that. So I wanted to digitize this collection because one, it only had 12 Polaroids, so that's pretty easy. Um, and also because Ansel Adams is the photographer and he's depicting a very well-known uh, family in the environmental movement. So this is actually the first collection that I have processed and have tested out sort of linking the digital objects into the finding aid. Um, so if you want to go to OAC, you can find the finding aid there. It's called the Ansel Adams Photographs of Wayburn Family. And you'll actually be able to see all of the Polaroids through the finding aid, which is really cool. And finally, I wanted to tell you all about this new program that the library was just approved for a couple months ago. And it's going to be a three-year project that's called Voices of Environmental Justice. And the goal of this project is for the library to serve as an informational resource for the Sierra Club and other environmental justice leaders and organizers. 
Now through this project, the Colby Library will be uh, conducting in-house oral history interviews with prominent environmental justice uh, activists and organizations. We'll also be um, working with those same activists and organizers to facilitate, will encourage and facilitate the transfer of their own archives to a university historical society, a, a, a collecting repository. And that will help fill some of the gaps that we're seeing around environmental justice archives. That there, not, there aren't a ton of them at the moment, but we wanted to be able to encourage these leaders to tell their stories and let them know that their work matters and it is important to save and to um, protect for future generations to use. Now this project's also going to be providing basic archival resources to help empower folks to start archiving their own material. So there'll be guidelines on digitizing, best practices for storing, kind of basic things that everyone can use. And this way, if somebody is not ready to move their papers onto a university, they can have some tools to know how to keep it around um, safely until they are ready. So this is a really exciting project that we are just beginning, um, but it is a great opportunity for us to move away from collecting the sort of early white, uh, history that we see so much in Northern California and really bring in some new voices of the people who are on the front lines of the environmental justice movement. So finally, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Sierra Club's equity journey and the library's role in this. So in 2020, in the wake of the George Floyd protests and subsequent public reconciliation of systematic racism in public history, Sierra Club described their own early history as intermingled with racism. In particular, Mir and some of his associates, such as Joseph Lacan and David Starr Jordan, were closely related to the early eugenics movement in the United States. And the early Sierra Club favored the needs of white members to the exclusion of people of color. The executive director of the Sierra Club, Michael Brune, wrote a uh, widely read, widely commented on um, article about the Sierra Club sort of reflecting on its past and righting the wrongs and correcting the harm that was done to folks throughout this um, century plus of, of sort of white supremacist systematic racism that, that we see. Um, so one of the quotes from Pulling Down Our Monuments is, the whiteness and privilege of our early membership fed into a very dangerous idea that exploring, enjoying, and protecting the outdoors can be separated from human affairs. If anyone is interested in actually reading the full uh, article, we have a link um, that we can put in the chat. It is called Pulling Down Our Monuments, White Supremacy in the Early Environmental Movement. So in response to this, you know, the library wanted to do something that told other stories that presented other narrat narratives of environmental history. So in 2020, we began compiling resource guides that examined um, the Sierra Club's equity journey throughout the years. When did the Sierra Club decide it wasn't diverse? When did they decide to actually do something that worked towards racial justice and environmental justice? Um, so this guide that we created has articles that the Sierra Club produced from Sierra Magazine, it has oral history interviews, it has footage from news stations, it has, um, I feel like I'm missing one thing, outside archives that relate back to this as well as, what am I forgetting? Maybe I got all of it, but um, really this guide is meant to not be a comprehensive guide of all the history uh, around equity, inclusion, and justice, but to serve as a starting point for somebody who would like to do the research themselves, um, giving them some citations and some direction for their research. Um, that was really what we wanted to do. The guides um, have been actually really useful, um, it turns out. The History and Future Task Force that was set up after uh, Michael Bruns article came out, um, used this resource guide to present to the board of directors 
um, some of the history that that needed to be lifted up. Um, this Colby Library also, you know, in addition to creating these guides, participates in the Sierra Club History and Heritage Working Group, which pulls together content to support like Women's History Month, Black History Month, Pride Month, um, to lift up stories and celebrate the accomplishments of, of people. So that's that. I would like to say as a final thought, um, especially in regard to the equity journey that I just mentioned, it wasn't like folks in the club knew to go to the library to get information on the history of the club. Seems a little odd, but it's just not in the minds of most people to think about libraries as a resource for that. So we really had to kind of make ourselves known that, hey, if you're going to do a major look at the Sierra Club's history, come talk to us in the library. We've got tons of materials. Um, and so that was a little bit about why we created the resources because we thought that would be an easy way to pass off some of this knowledge to folks that were actually digging deep into it. Um, but you know, we wanted to just let the entire community know that we are available to help them understand the history and to, to do the research. Um, so that's kind of characteristic of the Colby Library a little bit in the Sierra Club. You know, we're part of this enormous organization, this big grassroots organization, but most folks don't even know we're there. Um, and then part because the former librarian, like I said, was just to the max with things to do. So once I was able to come in and kind of relieve Therese of some of those other duties, now we're finding it to be a time when we want to celebrate what we have and let folks know. So that's why I'm doing, you know, processing of collections and publishing finding aids on OAC. I'm very much an outreach person with archives. So I want to make sure that all the work we're doing to preserve these collections actually has a access component to it, that we're not just saving it to save it and spend thousands of dollars a year to store it that this is actually important material and that it's available. It can be seen. It's not just for a certain group of people to see, it's for everyone to see. So that evolution of kind of bringing the public into the library is sort of where we're at as far as um, access to the collections. So that is, uh, um, <laughs> in a nutshell, like I said, Sierra Club and Colby Library. And I would be more than happy to answer any questions that folks have and pick my brain. It does not need to be about the Colby Library. It can be about the archival professional profession in general. Um, I am here for you. <laughs> what a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, so if you have a question, please um, plug it into the chat and I will read them off. And so, I think we had a question in here. Okay, yes. So we have one question to start off. It says, I would love to know how long the process took to review and accession the collection when you first started. Oh, Lord. Um, it took the, so first I started with a collection survey because Therese didn't know what we had. I certainly didn't know what we had. And I thought that would be a good way to kind of quickly get an overview of what was there. So I did that in, I think, 2019. And that's kind of also the time that I realized, you know, I should actually be called an archivist, not a digital archivist, because I'm doing some of that work too. Um, I would say it took probably about nine months to get through everything. Um, that was because I was working basically from no, <laughs> no documentation. So there were no hints as to what things were unless there was a piece of paper in the box that said this was brought in in 1968. So the survey took about nine months. The accessioning was largely based off of that survey of the content that I gathered at that time. So it didn't take nearly as long. I think I accessioned everything in archive space. It was over the last year and my time, sense of time is really off this year, but I, I would say it took about four months to do. And I don't really consider it done because there's so much room in archive space to add documentation about donations, where they came from, how we, how we acquired them. And so anytime I find some new piece of evidence about a particular item, 
I upload that documentation into archive space. Um, we store everything on Google Drive because we're a Google suite organization. So, I, you know, I have all of these donor folders on Google Drive and I kind of just link that content as needed. Wow, that's a lot of time. Um, so our next question is, what steps did you take to be an archivist for Sierra Club? Oh, I didn't really take any steps, to be honest. Um, my career in archives has always been sort of, not, I don't want to say it wasn't thought out, but, you know, I would take jobs that I got because there aren't a lot of jobs. So um, my job before the Sierra Club was in an LBG. LGBT uh, Historical Society, the GLBT Historical Society in San Francisco. And that kind of revealed to me that I, I liked sort of the activist side of, our, of archives. And I really fell in love with working with the papers of folks who were on the front line making change. It, it really moved me. And so I was looking to change positions and the Sierra Club job just popped up. So I applied and it just turned out that a lot of the stuff I had done at the Historical Society fit perfect with the Sierra Club. Um, I will say that I don't have an environmental studies background. My degree is in creative writing and <laughs> library science. Um, and that's kind of been the case for every job. I've never had expertise really going into any of them. But something I would stress is that, you know, in archives, anytime you're working with them, that's your training. That's where you learn about the subject. So I feel now, you know, two and a half years into the job that I know a ton more about the environmental movement than I did before. And that's all just because of sort of the byproduct of working with these papers over and over again. Um, we have another question and it is, what parts of the collection are used most by researchers? Yes, so let me think about that. <laughs> we get a lot of requests to, um, to look for a specific article in the early bulletins um, because those are such early documents around conservation. We get a lot of people who said, my grandfather was in the Sierra Club in the 1920s. Can you tell me anything about him? And we're able to go into the early membership list and see that. Or we work uh, a lot with the um, sort of the, I don't know exactly what they're called, but they're essentially like the brochures to publish, uh, publicize the Sierra Club outing trips. So it would say, you know, where they were going for that summer and all the people who were participating. So we get a lot of questions around that, similar with family members. You know, I know that they were on or they went to, you know, Yosemite in this year or he, maybe this year, I just want to know. And so that's kind of that fact-checking thing that I was talking about. Uh, but we get a lot of folks who want to review um, the photograph collections too. So one example is we had a person in over the last couple years who was working to establish the John Muir Trail um, in the Sierra Nevada as a national recognized trail. And so anytime you apply for national registry, there's a ton of research that has to go in. You have to create a report, you have to justify everything. So he was using actually a lot of the photograph collections, the early ones to try to pinpoint the exact location that this trail started. Um, so there's a lot of different uses. Internally, Sierra Club staff will ask me for Recently, um, one of the staff people was working with the um, National Parks sort of store, their, their kind of retail side, to create a Sierra Club themed brand of, of clothing. And this was right around the election. So they were all very like vote for the environment kind of thing. And so my role in that was I went through a lot of the old, the early protest photos that I could find and sent them to my colleague who then worked with the outside vendor to kind of adapt some of those slogans, some of those signs into something that was more modern. So I feel like I work in a lot in kind of the corporate side of archives, even though we're a nonprofit, but then we still get a lot of public figures who are studying environmental movements who, you know, want to get some research too. And a lot of those folks also go to the Bancroft Library to look at the Sierra Club records there too. <laughs> Um, it looks like we have a couple of people who are really interested um, in 
possibly working there at the Sierra Club. And we have a question that says, are you able to take on interns? And in particular, do you offer virtual internships? So we, in the past, have had interns. It's a paid internship. Um, it usually is summer or spring. We aren't really at a place this year where we can take on any interns, primarily because we've been away from the office for so long and a lot of sort of basic projects on site haven't been addressed. So it, it's probably unlikely that we'll be searching for any interns in 2021, but I would suspect end of 2021, early 2022, we'll kind of be picking that up again. And we, I believe we always advertise through San Jose as well. So hopefully any of you, if you're still around, will be able to kind of see that when it comes up. And, and those internships have been in the past uh, centered around sort of like surveying and reviewing the poster collection, or we also have a map collection. We had an intern go through those and kind of photograph them and kind of quote unquote catalog them. Um, I would love to get an intern who can work kind of more primarily on the archival side and do some collection processing and also work in archive space and kind of learn the ins and outs of that. Um, so it's, it's a wish I have. It's probably just not going to happen this year because of COVID, unfortunately. Um, and I think if remote was something that we could do, yeah, absolutely, we would take on a remote intern. Um, but there's a lot of planning that has to go involved, get, get, be involved with that. And we're just so stretched, <laughs> my colleague and I, so it, it's, it's hard to do that. But yes, is the, law, is the short answer. <laughs> We have another question here um, that says, have you seen an increase in access and use of the Weyburn family photos since the finding aid was uploaded to OAC? No, actually, <laughs> I have not. And I thought I would, but no, nobody has reached out about that. Um, there's a chance they're using it on OAC and I just don't know about it, um, but no, no one's reached out. And we kind of anticipated that folks would but it's been crickets, so. <laughs> um, we've got another question. Are there any groups or associations you recommend for students who are interested in the activism side of archives? Yeah, um, any community-based archive is usually um, activist at least sort of influenced. There's an, always an activist kind of level to a community archive. Um, so I would suggest if you're into queer history, looking into some of the LGBT archives out there. Um, there if you're in the Bay Area, there's the GLBT Historical Society. If you're in Southern California, there's USC's one um, gay and lesbian archive. There's a ton across the country too that, that are kind of just popping up. And that was a great way for me to kind of get involved in, in the social activism side of history. Um, as far as environmental groups, um, there aren't a lot of collections in environmental groups. Activists in the environmental movement at least are not really concerned with collecting things. They're very much living in the right now and are often way too busy to even think about their own history. Um, I'm trying to think, there's, the national park system is a great resource for anyone that's sort of interested in the conservation side um, because they have a lot of li <laughs> libraries and archivists and a lot of sites that um, we are kind of the perfect professional to run. But as far as environmental groups, I can't honestly think of any. And that's kind of why this, the Colby Library is such a weird kind of case in archives is because we do have this collection. We do have this long um, term library that's been used over the years, but our papers are not actually there. If you want to learn about the Sierra Club, you kind of have to go to the Bancroft Library to, to do that. Um, so I'm trying to find other organizations that are like this. If you know any, please let me know because I have not been able to find any and I would love to talk to somebody who's kind of in a similar position <laughs> as me, who's just like, where's the line between what we keep and what we send to 
to the major university. So I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> We have another question. Um, Robin is asking, what is the best part of your job? What I enjoy most about my job is the freedom, um, sort of the, the freedom to use my training toward doing something productive for the club. Um, since I'm the only archivist, I'm the only archivist in the history, 128 years of the club, there's no real standards in place. So it's really up to me to research and put together plans. And I really like that. It, it kind of reminds me of grad school a little bit in, in the sense that, you know, I have to kind of impose my own deadlines. I have to make sure that I stay on task for things. I have to constantly prioritize what needs to get done when. Uh, and I, I'm really receptive to that. That is the way I like to work. So I would say just the, the freedom that I have in my job and the support that I have. Um, I'm part of a, a union, the Sierra Clubs, uh, SEA is called. So we're, we're a unionized group. Um, we're part of the United Auto Workers. And through that, I have support like I've never experienced before. So that makes a huge difference. It really does. Um, I also just kind of like exploring the collections, like putting this puzzle together is a challenge, but it's really interesting. It is like starting an archives from scratch and you have to figure out, you know, okay, how are we going to label these? How are we going to box these? Where do they go? What is in there? Um, are we going to weed stuff out? All of those questions, maybe in the early part of my career would have scared me, but because I've worn so many hats over the years as an archivist, it now just kind of seems second nature to me. And I and I really like the challenge. Um, but doing that, you know, I depend on my colleagues a lot. So you all have this cohort here and hopefully you'll be able to stay in touch with one another when you kind of enter the professional world because this is a close knit profession. You see people over and over and over on a national level. And when you get stuck with something at your job, there's always someone you can reach out to who has done it. There's always somebody who has done what you've done. And there's no sense in reinventing the wheel if somebody can offer you some guidance or even documents like workflows so you don't have to start from scratch. Um, so this job has really taught me the value of leaning on my colleagues when I need to. Um, but that's also really fun. It connects me with the rest of the archival community. And when you work in an organization with like 700 people and none of them know anything about archives, you know, it's nice to have <laughs> a friendly face who you can talk shop with. That's great. Um, you've answered all of our guests, all of our audience questions. So um, we're going to wrap up this event. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. And um, Allison, do you have any closing words? I do. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. I was trying to multitask. Um, I actually had lots of questions, but I'm like, I'm not going to like, <laughs> kill everyone here. Um, but I thought that was really interesting. Thank you so much. And it's funny that um, uh, that you mentioned you're kind of looking for other people to sort of connect with when it comes to sort of the environmental activism. Um, I actually just listened to a presentation um, of a person who he had just left his job at the um, Obama Presidential Library, but he was talking about how he has gotten together with a group of um, Black archivists to help the community, you know, maintain and preserve and record their stories and give them the tips and the tools. And I, I think that's just such an interesting interesting aspect and, and um, way that professionals can help. You know, I mentioned, I kind of put in the chat, I was like, yeah, like take, take the, the, the materials outside of the kind of the ivory tower and make it accessible and make it meaningful and have the people that are closest to it, you know, write the description so they're accurate and relevant and, and make sense. So I don't know. I thought it was all really interesting and really exciting. So thank you for sharing all that. Um, 
I'm going to give one last plug to everyone that's still here. Um, if you enjoyed this and you want to get more involved, we are actually uh, just about to close our nominations for the um, SAASC board for the fall 2021, spring 2022. Uh, term. I'm going to put a link in the chat if you are interested in learning more about what is out there and available. And then I'm going to post real quick um, links to all of our key resources. That was what I was trying to do, which I should have done earlier. Give me one second. Um, so our website, our Facebook, our Twitter, um, we actually just launched a, finally, a LinkedIn group. So please join that if you haven't already. And let me post those right now. Um, and if you have any, oh, that didn't, there we go. If you have any questions, uh, you can always email us at uh, sjsusaasc at gmail.com and we will try to get back to everyone as quickly as possible. And with that, I just want to thank Joanna. Um, I want to thank Samantha for putting this all together. Uh, like I said, I still had tons of questions about like digitization and you know how you sold the whole concept and got funding and what your digital preservation plan is and all that crazy. So I know. <laughs> It's now you have to work in progress. <laughs> you have to maintain the physical collection and the digital collection. Essentially, um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of crazy stuff. Um, so thank you so much. That was really great. And I love and I'm jealous of your role because like you said, you, you kind of get to write the book on, on how you want to do it, um, which is really fun, though I'm sure it's sometimes a little lonely and <laughs> you would like some some input. Um, so with that, Samantha, anything else you want to add before we close it out? Um, nope. Just thank you so much, Joanna, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys. <laughs> Have